Lawrence, thanks very much. Um, I'm not really sure whether I should say kia tato or aloha, but anyway, uh, it's great to be back and to have the first thing I'm doing, having got off the plane this morning, is uh, uh, coming to see you all because it's a sign of the importance, actually, of the relationship between uh, central government and local government. I do want to acknowledge Lawrence, who I think does an outstanding job for you. I uh, see him every uh, month or so uh, with Malcolm in my office and uh, there are always very constructive meetings. We have a good opportunity to talk about what's on the mind of local government. Um, it's a free and frank exchange. We don't waste each other's time. We have a good chance to sort of uh, debate what the issues are and uh, to make sure that we uh, stay involved with each other and are on the same page. Also I want to acknowledge um, Todd and Louise who are with me today and of course Paul I think will be with you um, tomorrow. I suppose the first um, starting point that I'd make is, uh, uh, look, I don't know, you know whether I'm imagining things or whether it's the perspective we have, but I, I do think the relationship between central and local government is a very strong one. Um, there will always be points of debate or contest or slightly different uh, emphasis that happens between central and local government. That's just the nature of the beast. Uh, but actually, for the most part, um, the relationship I think that the government, hopefully ministers have, certainly that I have, uh, with mayors and councils around the country um, uh, is a very constructive one. I think and hope they all feel they can ring me if they need to. I mean, I'm around the country a lot. I'm frequently in the offices of mayors and uh, talking to councils, and it's a very constructive relationship. And when we have our local government conference each year, um, we've sort of gone away from um, sort of formalised speech notes and sort of um, platitudes written by officials, and I think we sit down and actually have a pretty decent discussion about what actually needs to happen. Um, we get our officials along, um, and that helps the process, and they can at least hear what's, what's happening. So I think for the most part, actually, central and local government are pretty locked at the hip. One of the reasons why I think that's really important is actually what you do matters, and it matters enormously not just to New Zealand or to your communities, uh, but it actually matters about whether we as a central government are going to be effective. So the three initiatives that uh, Lawrence uh, announced before, yeah, of course they're very high level, but they're actually a roadmap for how we're going to work together, and uh, all of those things are uh, areas that I'll be addressing in a pretty formalised way actually over the course of the next 12 months, both in terms of engagement with local government, but also in public speeches I make and policy the announcements that the government has. That's because those things um, actually matter. One of the reasons why local government matters, in my view, having been Prime Minister now for the better part of seven years, is government at a central level can pass any law it likes, uh, as long as it can get 61 votes in Parliament. Um, but whether that law actually ultimately is implemented and how it's implemented very much rests in a lot of cases with local government and to a certain degree with the courts. Uh, that's the reality. We, we, with the best of intention in the world, can write any piece of legislation you like and think we understand uh, what it means. Uh, but actually how it plays out in the communities is how you as a local government um, interpret it, uh, what uh, responsibility it puts on you, and ultimately when that's tested, you know, what the courts think. And uh, this week I think we'll be um, tidying a, something up that uh, is a problem for both of us actually from where I can sit, slightly more for you than us. Uh, but anyway, retrospectively we'll go and deal with that little issue. Um, but it's a great example of how we can pass the laws sometimes, but uh, making sure that they actually work in practice is, uh, is a very different issue. You have huge responsibilities. And um, I guess the starting point of that is just around crisis management. So obviously recently I was uh, in the Whanganui region, I um, want to acknowledge Annette and the mayors in that area, uh, did a great job I think of a very difficult situation, you've had the same situation down in Dunedin with uh, Dave recently, uh, and, and just generally around the country, uh, we're always going to have various degrees of natural crises to the extreme obviously Christchurch with the, with the huge earthquakes uh, some years ago, uh, but huge issues for local communities. So firstly, you are the port of call. The probability of, nat of, of a national uh, emergency being called is much lower than the probability of a local emergency being called. You run the process, you decide how that works, uh, you're intimately leading it. And actually what you do in terms of leadership really matters uh, because I can tell you actually from going to Christchurch, you know, I, I go to Christchurch still every week. 
pretty much when I'm in New Zealand religiously, I go to Christchurch every week. Um, but during the, the really bad time after the, you know, the February earthquakes in 2011, I was going down there every day. And a huge number of people would come up to me and say, oh, thank goodness you're here. Some people believe because I was there, no, no other earthquakes would happen because they figured that I wouldn't get sent there if it was dangerous, but uh, they probably don't know how, how disliked some of my, I am by some of my officials. But anyway, they were happy to see me there. But in reality, sometimes you'd go around and you'd do things and you'd look at things and you'd say, okay, is that really doing much? You know, just your presence there. And the answer is, well, of course, A, it informs you in terms of what decisions, you know, either us as central government or you as local government need to make. Um, but don't underestimate the, the sort of strength people take from the fact that as local leaders, you're there understanding what they're going through. Sometimes you will never be able to fix their problem. It's just, you know, they live in a path that's pretty flown, uh, flood prone and yep you might be able to do something to, to make the stormwater drains a bit bigger or work a bit more efficiently but the truth is floods are probably going to happen again sometime in the future but by being there you show them that you care you show them that they're not isolated on their own it really matters secondly I'd say is if, if you look at local government from my perspective um, and I think it's true from your perspective, a huge amount of what you do is really around infrastructure and the provision of infrastructure. We can have endless debates about you know, whether some expenditure is, is frivolous or some expenditure is too great. Um, the newspapers will have that debate all the time, but actually the, va the vast bulk of what you do is the provision of infrastructure and that is critically important for uh, your communities. It certainly underpins growth and without it, it can't happen. So we want more and greater, for instance, regional economic growth it relies on infrastructure for that to happen, ultimately, and that's hugely important. Certainly in terms of resilience in those communities, that's areas where we have to work together. And we're doing that, for instance, you know, if you think about very technical things that we work on together, uh, but we're in the process of, of changing legislation in Parliament, which will allow us to have greater rights when it comes to the rollout, for instance, of ultra-fast broadband and telecommunication sites for um, black spots, for instance. And actually, that really matters to your communities who need a mobile phone uh, or internet access and without it are very isolated and actually can't operate properly. So there's a hell of a lot that happens there. Um, we are all dealing with changing environments and um, those issues may, may well become more pronounced as the decades roll forward uh, with everything from climate change to you know, where people are living and what they're ultimately doing. But also um, it matters a huge amount around competitiveness. So one of the real strengths in New Zealand actually is that local government works very effectively with central government. You go to Australia and ask them how they find dealing with you know, a big federal government having to deal with state government, often having to deal with layers underneath that is a much more complex operating environment. Environment. And actually for all of the complaining that you'll sometimes get, actually most people will tell you New Zealand is a lot easier place to do business than most other places and that includes what they're doing at central and, and local government I think. Second thing is we are in partnership together, so if you look at something like Christchurch, um, Christchurch is now moving to the sort of next phase, I gave a fairly major speech the week for last down there about the, the next phase which is going to be regenerate Christchurch which is really talking about how's it, you know, how's it going to work from here. But what we've been really trying to do is say okay rather than necessarily Christchurch City Council having its own uh, development authority and the government doing some things through CERA, how can we put a bit more of a private sector focus on that but actually fundamentally be bringing those things together and passing more and more uh, responsibility back to uh, local government where it actually belongs. It's also true in, in housing, you know, Len has been more than enough of my speeches um, to hear me say all the time, yeah, in the end we're in this together. We can't make it work without um, speeding up the process and release of land. That's also true in other parts of New Zealand where we have special housing areas. Uh, but the fact that it's working and we've got the most uh, amount of construction actually happening in Auckland housing uh, for a decade is because Len and the Auckland Council supported special housing areas. Um, their people are working on a very efficient process for making that happen. And we're trying to work on, on um, neatly fitting in the infrastructure to support the growth in that housing. It's also true um, in uh, regional New Zealand, whether it goes everything from agricultural development, um, Stevie talked about tourism, uh, for which I'm the minister, uh, and that's absolutely true. 
So we work a lot together. Uh, we work a great deal with Maori, and we're seeing a lot more of that. And, and uh, you know, you only need to go and have a look at something like uh, Naitahu's role in the South Island, or ultimately, you know, the Waikato River, uh, to see what's happening there. And I think, for the most part, that's actually been working pretty well. We acknowledge that government, at a central level, has a lot more tools than local government. So there has been a, you know, what's a legitimate debate actually about how central, how local government can raise money. All I can tell you, I suppose, from a central government perspective is um, whatever we do, we try and do it to a degree in a consistent kind of way. So as Minister of Tourism, I do get um, parts of New Zealand that will put up their hand and say, we want to have a bid tax or we want to have this. Um, Auckland is clearly pushing for you know uh, congestion charging or other sort of tolling opportunities. We understand those issues. We understand the pressure on those communities. The counter argument only to that is just making sure that what we do in one part of New Zealand for the most part, can we uh, or are we prepared to support that somewhere else? Because sometimes those issues in another way are replicated there. So Rotorua is a place where lots of tourists come into town. Franz Joseph is a place where a lot of that happens. So they're just the issues that we have to work our way through. But we are very conscious of that. Um, I suppose I do want to make uh, mention for a moment around reorganisation. Uh, so. Look, you know, I don't, you don't need me to tell you what's happening in reorganisation because you've seen it. Um, and, and what it shows you is reorganisation is pretty difficult. Um, unless actually central government mandates it, it's immensely difficult to happen. It doesn't mean it can't happen, but it's a, it's a difficult process. The thing I think I would say about that is that, you know, reorganisation, you know, can make sense in certain areas. Um, there can be logic behind it. Personally, I'm a pretty big supporter of what's happened in Auckland. I don't just say that because um, our government in the end passed it. I think it genuinely is working. I think there are lots of examples which would not have happened if we hadn't had one mayor to go to and ultimately one council to deal with. I think that's just the reality of what we've dealt with. Um, but it's not going to be the right structure for everywhere. And I think we do need to acknowledge that what's also happening, whether there's actually formal reorganisation or not, uh, is that there's been a huge amount of work happening within councils, working together, sharing services, doing lots of things that actually are very productive. So there are different, many ways to sort of skin a cat. I suppose I just sort of um, want to make mention for a moment about your survey. Because on the one hand, I think, you know, we, you know, you spend money on these surveys. We do the same thing from time to time. Obviously, you know, there are public polls and public surveys and things that come out. Um, we ask obvious questions. So, you know, at your peril, you completely discard them because I think in the end, um, there's always sort of some gems in there. And there's actually always a degree of truth in a lot of what you know collective thought is, whether it's whether it's absolutely accurate or not can always be a debate. Um, but when people think things to a certain degree, you have to sort of acknowledge a bit of it. On the other side of the coin, what I would say is you have a pretty thankless task. Um, there aren't thousands of people in your communities putting up their hands saying, "Pick me to be mayor." You know, if it was that easy. You know, someone else would have done it earlier on. Uh, it's easy to pick holes and say, I don't like the particular thing that's happening there, um, or this particular piece of expenditure is not warranted or doesn't stack up. That may or may not be true, but it's like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. You know, sometimes you're doing something for a bigger issue. And actually, you don't live in a perfect world where you have endless resources. Yep, everyone can understand that you might need more infrastructure in your community, need to upgrade the water sewage you know, facilities that you have, build more local roads, seal more of them, all of those things, we all understand that. But you also live in a world where you have to manage your balance sheets, where you actually have to make sure that your balance sheets don't get out of control, where you can't just force ratepayers to pay more and more on their rates. And actually the same people that will complain at you that their road isn't sealed will complain at you, for, at you because you, haven't, you put their rates up too much. You can't have it both ways. So all I'm sort of saying to you is I think, you know, I'm not trying to undercut your survey because I think your survey is important, but take it all with a bit of a grain of salt. It's not an easy job actually. And uh, I think for the most part you guys do it pretty well. I suppose I just sort of finish really by saying that, you know, I think if you look at what's happening in, in the end in the economy, um, there's no question, I think actually domestically we have a lot of things going for us. 
you know, some are, are just a function of what's happened. Christchurch Rebuild is putting $40 billion into that region. Auckland just has an infrastructure deficit. It's a fast growing city. It's consistent with other cities around the world. You know, it's true in Sydney and it's true in Melbourne and it's true in New York and London. And actually, in a way, we should celebrate the fact that our largest city is an attractive place and that people actually want to come and live in New Zealand as opposed to living somewhere else. It's a badge of success. If everyone was rushing for the departure lounge at the International Airport, I'd be a lot more worried than if they were rushing for the arrival lounge. I mean, that's the, the truth of it, is that people come to New Zealand, want to live here because we're doing well. That's actually a good thing for our country, not a bad thing. It puts pressure on, on systems sometimes, but that's what's happening. And actually, if you look at, at what probably drives sentiment, things like dairy prices being down, for some of you that, that live in rural communities and agriculturally based communities, uh, actually your dairy farmers will be, will be struggling and they will be hurting and it will have an impact on your local communities to a degree. Um, but it's worth putting a bit of perspective in the fact that dairy is 5% of the New Zealand economy. So yes, it's important, uh, and I don't take anything away from that. Uh, it's about 20% of our exports, but it is 5% of our economy. And if you wander down the road to a beef farmer, they'll tell you they're getting more money than they ever have before. If you go off to, to Pukki and ask them how their kiwi fruit's going, they'll tell you they've recovered from PSA and they're booming along. If you go to most of your vineyards, they'll tell you they're doing exceptionally well in terms of wine. If you go to you know, the areas which are dominated by tourism, they'll tell you they've had a record number. I think. Um, last this year alone, around Chinese New Year, there were seven motels in the entire South Island that had any any vacancies. We're going to have three million tourists in New Zealand uh, within the next you know short space of time. Uh, we've got huge record numbers. Every single market that we target is growing. Every market. Australia, is, despite the fact it's about half our tourists, is still growing in terms of the number of Australians coming over. And you have got a pretty competitive exchange rate now relative to probably what you had a few months ago, so there's a lot of good things. But there is the international things, the things we can't control, dairy prices for instance, what's happening in Greece if there's a bit of a slowdown in China, those things are there. And, and if it's not those, then it may well be something else, because the politicians in the room, like all of you who have been around for long enough, will tell you that if it's not this issue, it'll be that issue. There are always issues. If you want perfection, don't become a politician in my view. Um, but this is the bottom line, I think, and that is how does New Zealand protect itself against all of that? And the answer is it has to stay competitive. We've become very competitive, very competitive. Actually, we have a very, um, there's been huge capital investment in our businesses right around New Zealand. Um, there's a lot more technology deployed. Our people are far more skilled. We're opening up more international markets. So, you know, you're getting pretty close to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a free trade agreement between the, us and 11 other countries, but including the United States and, and um, Japan, you know, being finalised. And you'll have plenty of people who will write to your local newspapers or ring up the radio station and tell you it'll be the end of the world because we're going to do a free trade agreement with America. The, if you go and have a look at the China FTA, which was signed by Labor in 2008, if you go and have a look at that, that particular deal, it has been 11 times more successful to New Zealand than the most wildly optimistic economist was. And it's been true for every FTA we have signed. Basically, they've always been more successful, whether it's CR with Australia, whether it be the one that we've done with Korea recently, um, ultimately, New Zealand's a great trading nation. So the only way for us to really cope, grow and succeed is when we're highly competitive. And for central government to be in that position where we drive economic growth, we need you guys to be on the same page with us. And I think you are. I think you understand that and I think you reflect that. Um, so look, in the end, um, things that affect you a lot, like the Resource Management Act, um, those reforms are coming. You know, we're working our way through it. It's, you know, the third go. Um, 
you know, it'll be yet another round. But I keep telling my officials, in the end, of course there are important things that we can write into that legislation. Yes, there are changes we can make. And yes, the court's interpretation of those new laws are likely to be different than the old ones, which is why we're changing it, because we think that'll be positive. But a huge amount of that responsibility will ultimately rest with you as councils and your planners and the, and the work that you do. We are in this together. And um, actually, I think it's been a highly effective partnership. I think if you look at New Zealand, we've been growing faster than Australia, the UK, the entire Eurozone, the United States, you name it, we've been basically the standout in the OECD. And we're highly likely to continue to be very strong over the decades ahead if we keep focused on what we're doing. So that's why we're here, because as I said at the start of my remarks, what you do matters. Um, we, we pay close attention to it and we try and work constructively with you. We won't always agree on everything, but I think for the most part we're going to agree on a lot. So um, have a great conference, wish you all obviously all the very best uh, for it and uh, look forward to, uh, to working alongside you over the course of the next 12 months. Kia ora tato.